I want to open with an unusually large number of scriptures than I would normally do. Okay. I'd like to begin with Matthew chapter 19, verse 17. So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. These words of Jesus, the whole verse, is repeated again in two other Gospels, Mark 10, 18. So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. Luke 18, 19. So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. Jesus is not saying anything new here. The psalmist said the same thing. Psalm 14, 1 says, there is none who does good. Amen. Psalm 14, 3 says, there is none who does good. No, not one. Amen. Psalm 53, 1 repeats the same thing. There is none who does good. 53, verse 3, there is none who does good. No, not one. Amen. Paul in Romans chapter 7, 18 says, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, Nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. I don't have a problem with any of these verses. In fact, I'm quite relieved to hear these verses because, it, you know, when I look at myself, I can relate. I can relate to these verses. You know, I know there is nothing good in, good in me. So I'm quite comfortable with these verses. That's why I read all these verses. You know, I'm quite comfortable listening to these verses. It means that, you know, not only is the Lord aware that there is no good in me, I'm not the only one in the world who, who has this problem. You know, they, I mean, everyone, each one of us, you know. It, it's, 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 it's a verse, you know, like the saying in Hindi, sola ana such, means, you know, it's 100% correct. What about you? How many of you will say that there is good in you? No one. So I'll give you zero marks for goodness and 100 marks for honesty, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. It's not surprising because goodness has gone out of fashion. Being good is out of fashion, you know. Today, being rich is okay. Being famous is fine. Being brilliant is fine. Being well connected is fine. Being beautiful is fine. Being very cultured is fine. Being very suave is fine. All of those things are fine. But good is very boring now. Being good is very boring. Have any of you ever seen a book with the title, How to Be a Good Man? Anybody ever seen a book with the title? There are books, How to Be Rich, How to Do This, How to Do That. But have any of you ever seen a book in any language, How to Be a Good Man or How to Be a Good Woman? I haven't. And by the way, you know, I'm, I'm somebody who reads a lot. You know, I have personal collections of books of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Okay, that apart I've read tons. But I've never ever come across a book which is titled How to Be a Good Man. I once remember, uh, remember seeing an article advising women how to get a good man. <laughs> you know? But I've never found any article saying how to be a good man. <coughs> Have you ever seen a newspaper article which said social scientists discover a good man in Delhi? Or a good man found in Cochin? Have you ever heard the proclamation about good man found? Never. Have you ever read an obituary about a man whose sole virtue was he was a good man? 
any newspaper ever published an obituary about a man whose sole virtue was he was a good man. Good is boring. Good is not in fashion. Nobody wants good anymore. In fact, there is things like, you know, at least in, in, in management thinking, good is the enemy of the better. You know, so good is really become very, very unfashionable. To say something is good or, you know, to use the word good is, it's almost like an insult now. Nobody wants to be known as good. It's like, you know, those, like an ambassador car. You don't see it anymore. It's out of fashion. Or shirts with those long collars or, you know, long sideburns, you know. It's not there. Or like a herald car. You don't see it anymore. Good is gone. Cool is fine. Hep is fine. All, all of that is fine. But good is not in vogue. Good, being good is not a style statement. You know, who wants to be good now? Has anyone come to you lately and said, tell me how can I be good? Five ways to be a good man? No. Nobody is interested in being a good man. The only two places where you hear reference to good. When I was thinking about this, you know. One is you go to, go to a funeral, they'll say he was a good man. <laughs> they'll shake their head and they'll say, you know, whatever. They'll say, that's, you know, that's one time where they'll say, good, everything will be good, you know. The other time when people will use the word good, is let's say, you know, somebody is leaving town and going away to another city or country or something, you know, they'll everybody will come, have a few drinks, and then they'll, you know, either before they give the farewell gift or the after that, they'll, you know, the, for he's a jolly good fellow. <laughs> These are the only times when people will use good now. Do you can you think of any other situation where people will use the word good to describe someone? Nobody wants to be described, you know. When you're high and drunk, you know, for he's a jolly good fellow, you know, it's, it's fine, you know, he's a good guy. So when Jesus said there is no one good, or the Bible says there is no one good, not one, you know, maybe he already read the times, you know, he was ahead of his times, so to speak. But when I read the Bible a little more, I find, and I'm quoting here, okay, Psalm 37, 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Psalm 112, 5, a good man deals graciously and lends. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Proverbs 12, 2, a good man obtains favor from the Lord, but a man of wicked intentions he will condemn. Proverbs 13, 22, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the wealth of the sinner is stored up for righteous. Proverbs 14, 14. I'll read the second part of the verse. But a good man will be satisfied from above. So there is such a creature called good man in the Bible. Right? On the one hand it says, there is no one good. Jesus himself says there is no one good. But here you find that the Bible itself referring to this creature called a Good man. Jesus says in Matthew 12, 35, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart will bring forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. So Jesus is definitely referring to a good man, okay, somebody who's living, who brings out good from the good treasure in his heart. Matthew 25, 23, his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. So there is such a thing, there is such a species in the Bible as a good man. What is a good man? Who or what is a good man? 
One of the problems today, you know, I feel when I think about it, that earlier people used to live together. You know, entire families used to live together. So the grandparents would model to their sons, would model to, you know, people were modeling good behavior or what is goodness to the next generation. Today, we are all in nuclear families. So it's very hardly anyone with vintage and with experience and who's learned the wisdom of ages to model what is good to the next generation and the next generation after that. So people, each generation is now having to discover what is good for himself or herself. A lot of times, especially in Kerala, I find that we are all fed with a not all, I mean many, are, are, are fed with a staple diet of the maybe seven in the evening till nine o'clock in the night TV serials. Do you find any goodness there? So the only kind of mod behavior that we are you know, kind of seeing and being reinforced is all negative. It's all negative behavior. It's, it's, it's you know, the, the, I see, I like, you know, once in a while, when you're flipping channels, you just see like 30 seconds. I've never seen a lady smiling. She's always, you know, scheming. I've never seen one scene, you know, somebody generally happy in a TV serial. Everybody's got that, you know, I'll get you in the next moment kind of look, you know, either biting her teeth, you know, Allah, you know that there's some wheels within wheels within wheels going on in our mind. So, you know, like that's what we are exposed for at least three, four hours a day, 31 days a month. So there's no modeling of what is good. So what is good? No one talks about being good anymore. Some years back, you know, there was a movie which came out, A Few Good Men, you know, A Few Good Men. So today I want to take from the title and speak about a couple of good men from the Bible. And let's see if we can learn anything from their lives, okay? It's time, at least for a few people in this country, to get back to focusing on the virtue of being good. We know every other virtue. We know the virtue of being beautiful. We know the virtue of being rich. We know the virtue of being clever. We know the virtue of being well-educated. We know, we, we know the virtues of being well-connected. We know the virtues of all that, of being politically correct. We know the virtues of every other thing. But we've somehow lost the virtue of, of being good. Acts 11.24, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. We know that the he here refers to Barnabas. Okay? For he was a good man. We know that God sees everything and everyone. Right? God sees everything and everyone. Hebrews 4.13 says, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So there's nothing hidden before God. Such a God is writing of a man, Barnabas, for he was a good man. So we need to take that seriously. This is not David saying of someone, he is a good man or one of the disciples giving a personal opinion about somebody else, she is a good woman. No. This is the Holy Spirit writing through the writer of Acts, through Dr. Luke, that Barnabas was a good man. Actually, Barnabas was not his real name. If you read the scripture, you know that his real name was Joseph. And he was from... Cyprus. Acts 4, 36, 37, it says, And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So the first thing we learn about this good man is that there was a particular character trait about him, which caused the disciples to give him a nickname. Right? 
if somebody always comes up with an excuse, sooner or later he might get the, everybody else in the office might start calling him Mr. Excuse, you know? Mr. Excuse, what's your excuse today, you know? So people get, will get nicknames pretty soon. But there's something in Barnabas, in Joseph, that caused him to get a nickname. His nickname was that he was an encourager. It does not say that he lent his sh shoulder to everybody who had a problem to listen to their woes. Okay, I, all of you have known me for at least a couple of years now, and you know I don't make sexist remarks, but, I've also, but I just want to make one now, okay? It's not, for whatever it's worth, maybe true, maybe half true, whatever. But I've noticed, especially among women, there's a tendency to lend shoulders to listen to other people's problems. You will listen for one hour to the other person's problem, okay? Without offering some solution at the end, biblical-based solution. So the other person would have come heavy and miserable, but will go back light and miserable. But beginning and end, she is still miserable, you know? So the Bible does not encourage us to just listen for listening stake, to pour out your problem, I'm here, agony aunt, to listen to your problem, no. I don't know if Barnabas was that kind of guy, listening to everybody's problems. If he did, one thing he knew, one thing he did for sure, at the end of listening to the man or her, the lady's problems, he made sure that he encouraged them to get up and go forward. Not light and miserable, but light and encouraged. You saw the video which Anwanti sent, I think earlier this week, right? Of the guy running the Olympics, who was a show winner in that Barcelona Olympics game. And he pulled a hamstring, but he just couldn't finish the race. So his dad came down and put his arm around the shoulder. And they finished the race. There was no chance of winning the medal for sure. They probably finished a few, you know, couple of, you know, 10 minutes late. But they finished the race. That is a Barnabas spirit. Somebody who will let you, help you finish the race. Not sit down in the middle of the track and cry with you. There's no sense in that. This is putting your arm around the other guy and helping him or her finish the race. You know, I mean, a couple of weeks back I was reading the Bible and one verse just leaped out for me. You know. It says there, but the one who prophesies, it's in 1 Corinthians 14.3, but the one who prophesies speaks to the people for their strengthening encouraging and comfort. When you speak, when you and I speak, and right now I should be doing that, when you, know, when you prophesy, not necessarily in terms of telling the future, but in just you know, sharing God's word, we should be strengthening, we should be encouraging, and we should be comforting. When I am speaking, if I don't do one of these three, or all of these three, definitely at least one of these three, then there's something wrong. Because I'm not edifying, I'm not building you, okay? Or if I'm not encouraging you to get up and finish the race, or if I'm not, you know, somebody who's in pain, if I'm not comforting that person, you know, showing him that God is above all this, then I'm falling short. I'm not doing a good job prophesying. That was Barnabas. Every time he opened his mouth, it was a word of strengthening a fellow believer. It was an encouragement. Let's, we can do this. Life is tough. Life happens. Life is very tough. But God is with us. Let's move on. He was an encourager. And third, he was a comforter. Another word, translation says, it means son of consolation. A son of encouragement or a son of consolation. Think of this. Who gave him the nickname? It says here, and Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles. This was not the Kapiar who gave him that name. This was the apostles who gave him that name. Meaning what? Barnabas was an encourager for Simon Peter, James, his brother John, Philip, Thomas Matthew, 
James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon, and Bartholomew. Of all of them, he was the encourager. The highest human authority in the church found encouragement from a lonely soul called Barnabas. People in authority need encouragement. Especially people in authority. You and I will never know how lonely it is to be in Joe Single's shoes. Or to be in Pastor Raj. Anyway, or uh, you know, Brother Joe Sanathan. We don't know how lonely it is. Or how tough it is. What does it mean never to take a wrong step? What does it mean to have every word that you say measured? What does it mean to balance the entire pressure of everything that you have to do? What does it mean to get from the Lord and, you know, make sure? What does it mean to be accountable for everybody in, in your group? To have to answer for everybody in the group? What does it mean? Added to that, you know, every normal human pressure you know, buffeted from within and buffeted from without, you know. People in authority need our encouragement. Barnabas was a man who encouraged the apostles. They called him by a new name. You're no longer Joseph, we'll call you Barnabas. After that, he's never known as Joseph. He's always referred to as Barnabas, Barnabas, Barnabas. Barnabas. 